Hey, everybody. We have a great guest here. I'm so excited to have a chance to speak to my friend, Diana Butler Bass. She is an author, she is a historian, and she's written a book that is very, very significant, and it's called Freeing Jesus, Rediscovering Jesus as Friend, Teacher, Savior, Lord, Way, and Presence. Hi, Diana. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Marianne. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you. You know, we're talking about transformation. Obviously, we're at a time of tremendous change on the planet. Um, some things that are changing in a bad way and other things that are changing in a good way. And it's very easy to get caught up in the conversation of that which is disintegrating. And then it's so important that we make sure that we keep our minds and our hearts open to all the things that are transforming in a positive way. And I see you as such an example of that. You have written 11 books on American religion, particularly Christianity, and you are part of a transformative element within the Christian tradition, and particularly with this book more than any, uh, on the topic of Jesus. So you start the book, I think at the very beginning, with a scene in which you, I think, were at the National Cathedral, and you heard the voice of Jesus, and he said, get me out of here, which is similar to an experience I once had that I'll tell you about it. But Tell us what happened. You hear this voice. Uh, you know it's his, and as you feel in your heart. Uh, get me out of here. And basically your journey that followed from there is the journey of the book. So tell us about it. Yeah, that was probably the most unexpected thing. I, I think that I when think so. you actually hear God's voice, it's not usually something that you would expect to be said to you. Mm -hmm. And so... I was praying in a side chapel at the Washington National Cathedral, and um, I was wrestling, God, where are you? I was feeling a, a bit lost. And as I was doing that, all of a sudden I heard this voice that said, get me out of here. And I, I, I first thought it was someone talking to me, and I went back to my prayers, and then the voice came a second time, get me out of here. And I looked up, and there's this magnificent icon of Jesus painted by N.C. Wyeth above this altar in the Washington National Cathedral. And I just went, Jesus, it, is that you? And the voice came a third time, get me out of here. And I literally was completely freaked out. I did not know what to do. And I basically bolted out of the cathedral. Um, the only person I told when this happened uh, was in 2013 was my husband, Richard. And um, he has always referred to this incident as the time that Jesus asked you to spring him from the slammer. Yeah, you say that in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I, I wondered, you know, what, what does that mean? You know, that Jesus wants out of the national cathedral. And ever since then, I really, I think I've come to understand it a lot better and that really does wind into this book is that, you know, people are leaving church and essentially they're, they're trying to make a life with Jesus beyond the walls of conventional or institutional religion. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I happen to <clears throat> like church. I think church does, churches can do a lot of great things. And I've really been a fan and supportive and urging them on to do their best work over the years. But I also recognize this other thing that there are real problems and real limits and that church needs to change. And as people are struggling with that, you know, they're trying to make a life of faith in a yeah. different place. And so this book is both for people who are still in church, who are dissatisfied with the way that Jesus is talked about um, and how their experiences of Jesus might be minimized. Um, and it is for people who have left institutional religion or trying to live faith in the world. And so what does Jesus, how does Jesus go on that journey with them? And of course, the largest growing religious denomination, as it were, are people who want to know more about Jesus, but don't necessarily want to become Christian or identify uh, with the Christian religion. Because the slammer, as Richard called it, the imprisonment, is the dogma and the doctrine that many people can no longer relate to. You know, when I uh, started reading A Course in Miracles, remember, I'm Jewish. I was raised with nothing other than we don't read that book, darling. That's not what we read. And that Jesus was a, was a Jew and that he was a teacher. Other than that, I knew nothing. So when I started reading The Course in Miracles and I got so excited 
about the Jesus in the Course, which is not within the Christian religion, I was so surprised, Diana, to find that my Christian friends had much more of a freaked out reaction than I would have expected. When I started talking about Jesus, they were like, oh my God, has she become a born again Christian? Uh, And I have met so many people who, as students even of the Course in Miracles, have had a a lot more problem than I have grappling with that. There is, for a lot of people, a real ambivalence about Jesus because they do not have positive experiences with the with the church or, as I said, they don't identify with the doctrine and the dogma. So you are presenting with this book and with all of your work a Jesus for, as you said, people who, those who wish to stay within the religion, wish to be part of the religion, as well as those who don't which is a Jesus sprung, or as you say in the title, freed from the confines of the dogma and the doctrine. What is the freed Jesus? The Jesus that I introduce people to is the Jesus of experience. Mm -hmm. I want people to be able to take stories like the one you just told, how you encountered Jesus in the Course of Miracles. And I know that you, you don't need to be told this, but A lot of people need to be affirmed when they encounter Jesus in these unexpected places, when they when they have some sort of uh, surprising, uh, you know, meeting Jesus. And those those experiences are really valuable. And so churches and conventional religion, I think, has often tried to shy away from experience because They'll say things like, well, you know, the Jesus of experience could lead you to poison the Kool-Aid and, you know, make 300 people drink it to their death. And so we can't trust the Jesus of experience. And and whenever somebody says that to me, I turn around to them and I and I say, well, what about that Jesus of the Crusades? Or the you know? pedophile that priests. Was... <laughs> yeah, that's what I was right. being interviewed once by a New York Times reporter who said, well, you need the confines of the church because otherwise I could do crazy things. And I, it was only afterwards that I thought I should have asked him about all those pedophile priests. Uh, you know, it's, it's insane to suggest, uh, as they so arrogantly do, that, that their institutional religion is free of any kind of dysfunction or moral turpitude (laughs) but those on the outside you know they they gotta be guided um so i I think everybody gets the the jesus that is no longer of interest to many people you're talking about the jesus of experience and the book tells beautiful stories You you know one of my favorite uh stories in the book is about which i related to very much is when you were a young mother and you mm. felt confined. And you were thinking that you were sort of Im- imprisoned within that experience, you know. I mean, it was, I love my baby, but enough is enough, just walking her up and down the street in her stroller. And you met a neighbor, I think, who was a theologian or something. Anyway, she talked to you about how, I think the term something about in the little spaces. Uh, tell me about that, the, because I thought it was so profound and so true. The little, the seemingly little things of life where you can find Jesus as you describe him in the book. The friend that um, I'm talking about in that portion of the book is a woman by the name of Phyllis Tickle. And uh, she was the original editor of the religion section of Publishers Weekly. Wow. She died a few years ago. And she was an amazing person, some 20, 25 years older than than I am. And so she was a neighbor of mine when I lived for a couple years in Memphis, Tennessee, and I had this beautiful little baby. And occasionally Phyllis would come over to my house and we'd sit on the front porch of this big old rambling southern house that I had on the porch swing. And I was telling her, you know, that I was really sad that I couldn't be out in the world and that I didn't know if I was ever going to write anything again, you know, because mothers just get so so caught up in all the 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 stress of those early years and the minutia and um yeah and and she pointed out that that god in jesus in particular is often found in the the quotidian things the everyday things and so she she got me a book by Kathleen Norris, mm-hmm. um, who is a wonderful mm-hmm. writer, written for a spiritual writer, uh, called, I think it was called uh, Laundry, Liturgy, and Women's Work. <laughs> and um, it, uh, that, that book really helped me 
to see that, you know, sitting on the porch swing or taking care of my baby, walking around the streets of Memphis with the baby carriage and all those kinds of things were real places of spiritual encounter. And that as I opened my eyes to that, I could really sense that, that Jesus was, was with us. And, um, it was, it was a beautiful time of life. It actually went too fast when uh, I think back on it, even though I felt at the time that it was never going to be over. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the kind of thing that I do in the book is I, you know, I pick up these different parts of my own life and try to talk about how God was present and uh, in using Christian language and understanding of Jesus how Jesus in particular was, was present. A Christian minister friend of mine once said, there is no spot where God is not. And if you think of this as something inside yourself, then whether you are washing the baby or giving a talk to hundreds of people, the presence is, is, is not defined by where you are or what you're doing. I often say I'm not trying to get a message out, I'm trying to get a message in. And uh, I, too, when my daughter was a baby, I, I felt it suffocating. I felt it overwhelming. And I can't remember the book I read. It wasn't the Kathleen Norris book, I, although I read one of her books later. I can't remember what it was called, but it was very helpful to me about learning how to be present. Uh, it, it's an intimate relationship, uh, a mother and a baby, a small child. And that the small child is so completely dependent. You are their world. So if you have any intimacy problems, <laughs> any intimacy issues, uh, I, I noticed that that uh, showed up uh, with my daughter. So how do you... I'm not, I'm not oh, I was going to say, I'm not surprised that you sort of honed in on that chapter because that chapter is called Jesus as Presence. Mm -hmm. And then there I talk about embodiment and... Um, how Jesus is also our mother mm -hmm. using some language mm -hmm. from the medieval mystical tradition, Christ, our mother. You talk about, so um, it's definitely a place where we, co where our, I think our hearts are in complete harmony. You talk about the word kingdom and kingdom. And you say a lot of people are moving away from the word kingdom and moving into kingdom. Tell me about that. Yeah. The, that's a switch that started probably about 25 or so years ago. It was first suggested by, I believe, a Latina theologian. And uh, she was arguing that the word kingdom still has all these sort of hierarchical and power dynamics that work very much against uh, women and people of color. And so she, she moved towards this idea of thinking it, about what Jesus promised us, this, this, this realm or this reign, this dominion. Those are all words that have been used in the Christian tradition to describe the world that Christ imagines, wants us to imagine coming into being through Christ's presence. And, um, so, so she, she actually began to suggest the idea of la familia, you know, la, the family and that, um, that it was a kingdom where all people are connected to one another. And so there's a, there's beautiful resonances with that, um, in different parts of Christian tradition. It would seem to me. And since she, I'm sorry, she did suggest it and it's become just a more popular term mm -hmm. in some circles to talk about. Now in the Jewish religion, we pray this. to the Lord, our God, King of the universe. I like King of the universe, actually that works for me, but I certainly understand what she's saying. You just spoke about the world that we we seek to bring into being through the Christ presence. Tell me what the Christ presence is and tell me what the world is that we're trying to bring into being. The, the Jesus that I have encountered, and I talk about that Jesus in so many, using six main metaphors in this book, you know, friend, uh, teacher, savior, Lord, which kind of comes closer to the king language that you were just using, um, way and presence. And so uh, that's not six different Jesuses. Those are metaphors for the, the same thing the same person. And so the way I think of who Jesus is, is Jesus is an embodiment of God's compassionate love. And, um, as, as bearing that love in Jesus own body, that 
was a phenomenon. That was something that happened 2,000 years ago, uniquely with this, this human being. But Jesus is also a continuing presence through the life of, of the people who encounter him. And, um, you know, the, it, the, the New Testament talks about how the church is now the body of Christ. And you have a lot of the mystics in Christian tradition, like Teresa of Avila, who's one of my favorite saints. Uh, she talked about how Christ has no hands except for yours. Christ has no eyes except for yours. Christ has no feet except for yours. And so in a very real way, we become the, that body as we carry forth the presence of Christ in the world. So, so when I think of Jesus, I think of wisdom. I think of embodied compassion. I think about uh, the, this just incredible vision of justice uh, that Jesus had of servanthood and that all of those things somehow um, are made manifest in the world through the people who em embrace Jesus and who want to live like Jesus and follow Jesus. Yes, in the Course in Miracles, he says, I need your hands, I need your feet, I need all the things mm -hmm. what she was saying. So we have a, a country which is primarily Christian, and yet we have a country that is not only grappling with a profound harnessing of hate, but much of that harnessing is in the name of Christianity. So what went wrong? What's happening? Well, I, you know, it actually hurts to talk about this um, for me. It, in so many different, at so many different levels, because it makes me, it makes me really sad. It breaks my heart. Um, the manuscript, uh, the the book came out in March. So on January sixth this this year, when the insurrection at the Capitol happened, um, you know, the book was well underway, and there was no nothing I could add at that point. But I remember sitting watching the television and seeing those people at the Capitol and one thing just kept standing out to me over and over and over again. And that was the people who were there with Jesus saves signs. And I, I just, I saw that picture of like the, the gallows that had been erected and then the Jesus saves sign in the same frame at one point. And I started crying in front of the television because anyone who knows anything about the love of God, um, I don't even see how they could put those two images together. And, and yet they did. And, and so, you know, what did happen? Well, I think that there's been a group of Christians who have basically claimed Jesus in such a way that, He's almost like their their crusading warrior king. This is kind of why the the language of king kind of worries me. And um, you know they believe that Jesus is going to judge the unrighteous and and punish the wicked, and that Jesus is concerned with um, getting revenge for who they feel are the 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 people of faith. And they count themselves as the people of faith and they exclude everyone else. And so it's a very demanding, singular, angry Jesus. And it's also uh, obviously a white supremacist Jesus. There's been a lot of really, I think, good work done on that in the last year. And um, it's also a very male, toxic kind of masculine Jesus. It, in A Course in Miracles, there's a line, some bitter idols have been made of him who came only to be brother to the world. Oh, um, Marianne, that's You beautiful. have a PhD in religious studies from Duke University. You've written 11 books on American religion. Um, there's no way you haven't studied the history of religion. You know about the Inquisition. Um, you just described what has happened in America today. And I'm sure that you have a deep understanding of times in our history where it's happened before, as well as times in world history where it's happened. Go a little deeper with me. What is, is it a theological force? Is there a devil? Is there a counterforce to God's love that would use religion of all things and use Jesus of all things as a kind of front 
for this, what you and I would see as ungodly activity? Surely you've grappled with this. I know it makes you sad, but with all your education and all your expertise, I'm sure it makes you more than sad. Um, I think a lot of people would like to hear your insight. What the heck is going on? What, what is this really about? I think many people, even in America, perhaps particularly in America, that thought that this kind of thing, we were past that. We, we didn't have to worry about those kinds of things anymore. And this almost barbaric misuse of the idea of a loving God is back. What's going on, Diana? Well, uh, the New Testament talks about powers and principalities. Right. And one of the ways that, you know, I think a lot of people interpreted that through like, you know, Sunday school tradition or, you know, kind of popular religion is thinking about, you know, demons with little horns or, uh, you know, the devil made me do it, that kind of uh, sort of personification of the powers and principalities into, you know, I think, a kind of a almost a, a Halloween cartoon. And that's not what the New Testament is talking about. The New Testament is talking about powers and principalities, these 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 forces of corruption and oppression that that undermine the 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 dream of God that take us away from from love and compassion and those powers and principalities are often manifest in systems and structures that we human beings have created to perpetuate our own power and to perpetuate, um, I think that not just our power, but to, to, in a sense, make ourselves immortal. I mean, there, these are the sorts of questions I think that were in Genesis. You know that that the, the those first questions about pride and the first the first questions about competition and the first questions about hey, you know, with Cain and Abel, you liked his offering better, so jealousy and envy. And, and, and as the, the stories of scripture um, unfold, trying to explain sort of the, the, the dark nature of what's going to happen in human history, um, it, so much of it is wrapped up in these ideas of retaliation and, and vengeance and envy. And we want to get rid of anything that we think would get in our way of being the best superior. Where are they? And so those powers and principalities are, are with us. Where are they? Are they in our minds? Are they in the world? What are they? Oh, that, you know, that's a really good question. I, I do think that they take on a kind of life in our in our society in our institutions and in groups of people i mean have you i i've certainly been in groups of people i'm i'm sure that you have where our better angels come out you know it's like you're in a group of people and and there's there's joy and singing and that maybe a you know sort of a sort of a glorious moment of realization that we're that we all are brothers and sisters that we are all one that uh, yes we can be empowered i i've actually been at conferences with you where i've, I've felt that develop in a room yes and so so in that sense the the better angels of, of our nature is they're sometimes called can they become physical um in sense that they're with us. And I think that the same thing happens with those other forces as well. And, you know, I've certainly been in physical locations. I don't talk about this kind of stuff very much, but I've been in physical locations or groups of people where like I've walked into a room and just, I, everything felt wrong. And it was not, it, it really wasn't me. It was, it was like some other presence that was in this in the space or in the group so i do think there is a kind of uh, th that the powers and principalities do inhabit um the world um in the same way sort of angels and love and and goodness and kindness 
they inhabit the world too. So I do think there's that level. And then I also think that there's a lot of wisdom in the things that you've taught over the years in that um, the powers and principalities in a sense are the corruptions of our, of our own consciousness is that we have come to, we just don't see clearly. We don't see ourselves clearly. We don't see, see love clearly. We don't see God clearly. And that, so, so we, we have this really, we have clouded vision and that clouded vision causes us to act in ways that, that are not for the benefit of the world. Jesus said, my kingdom is within and the word psychology yeah. did not exist yet. The word psyche did not exist yet. So if you just take my kingdom is within and understand it as the mental landscape, yeah. I mean, uh, there's a book you've probably read, Breaking Hate, by Christian Piccolini. Have you read that book? He's the one. No, I he's the one who used to be a skinhead. He was from the age of something like 14 to 22. He was a big time Nazi leader, and he oh, yes. and he um, and then he was he transformed. It was a woman that he met, and he became. There's this phenomenon called formers, and it's people who used to be Nazis, used to be skinheads, and they work with people to get out of that. But the part of the book and his story that really impacted me was that he was a kid. His parents were working all the time. They didn't have time to spend much with him. He was a lonely, isolated kid, and he was smoking a joint in a back alley one night, and this man comes up to him and says, get that out of your, get that out of your um, mouth. That's what the Jews want you to do. Uh, and gives him and indoctrinated him into this horrible Nazi ideology. But the reason he was able to get him was that he showed him for the first time in Christian's life somebody who apparently cared what he did. Oh, Yeah. And we have read, you know, everything from ISIS to QAnon about right. how there is a kinship that people mm -hmm. often find in some of those uh, areas that you and I would call the powers and the principalities, whether it has to do with Nazis, yeah. whether it has to do with, you know, whether it's here, whether it's anywhere else. And out of that, that sort of petri dish out of which we see the horrible misogynistic and homophobic and anti-Semitic and racist and bigoted, all of that manifestation. But it seems to me where there is not love, that which is not love has power. If we don't show people love, then that force, that active force of not love will get in there and grab people. That's actually a, a thread through uh, some of Christian theology because the, the, you know, the temptation has always been, I think, within Christianity to set up God and the devil, you know, and it's almost like this sort of war uh, between these two forces. But when I think the best of Christian theology recognizes the fact that, that love is actually the power that love is, thine the, is most. the power, thine is the glory, thine is the kingdom, thine. Right. That, right. That is it. The compassion that is at the very center of the whole of the cosmos. That's the love of God. And that is the really powerful force. That's the transformative force. That's the force that causes, calls us into the best of who we are. So then what do you, what do we do about this other stuff? And, um, a lot of people have said throughout the history of the church that it's the absence of love. Well, yes. And, and it's, right. yeah, the course. And, and so that's I'm sorry. what I'm hearing in the comments yeah, you're making. Sure. The course in miracle says fear is to love what darkness is to light. Darkness is not a thing. That's why it's not a contest. Darkness doesn't fight lo uh, light. Light is darkness is just the absence of right. the light. But I think we're living at a time in this country and around the world where the question of evil is up for people. And I, and I know that you and I share many, uh, political perspectives, much as you've been uh, referring to here, seeing corruption, seeing oppression, seeing injustice. And it has felt to me 
and this is aberrational because this does not go far back in American history, but it seems to me that we're living in a period where people from a more social justice perspective, for instance, keep trying to see this as a transactional matter where, when in fact something much deeper than that is going on. And to leave out the religious and the spiritual conversation is to, is to fail to get to the root. Um, I mean, we can talk about how love is transformative, but I think people want to know well, how do we transform these things that, as you said, make you very sad. But I think your work, my work, all of us who write about these things, talk about these things, we have a bigger job than just being sad about them, right? Right. That, that's and correct. that's why I think it's so important. The, the, the reason your book is beautiful to me is because, and all of your work, is because if people have an experience, not just an idea, but, you know, reading your book there, in the best books you read between the lines, you know, it's, it's an emanation, a transmission of something that's coming to you. And yours is a very tender and soft and gentle that you feel sort of held in embrace while you're reading the book. If more of us, particularly more children, were given the notion of that love as the centerpiece of their lives from very early, like Christian Piccolini, that, that when people do not feel loved, that's what's so dangerous today. When people do not feel loved, and you get a whole bunch of people together who do not feel loved, that becomes a Petri dish out of which... All manner of societal dysfunction arises, and people become very vulnerable to ideological capture by genuinely non-loving, even psychotic forces. This is where I think that Christian fundamentalism has gone so astray, mm -hmm. and the they teach children. The, some of them teach children to hate. In yeah, the, name the of second Jesus. major, yeah, the second major story in the book after the 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 introduction with. Jesus saying, get me out of here. I move into the first chapter. And th that story is me as a three-year-old sitting in a circle in the Methodist Sunday school uh, where I, you know, was a little, little kid. And the teacher, I still remember her name, Miss Jean, was sitting on one of those little teeny tiny chairs <laughs> that, that you have in elementary schools and kindergartens and stuff. <clears throat> and she was reading us the story about how Jesus welcomed the little children. And she held up this picture, you know, this kind of a corny picture. I've actually managed to track it down over the years of Jesus surrounded by a group of little children. And... Um, the children were all different colors and ethnicities is very inclusive kind of diverse picture. And uh, there was one little girl who was, whose head was leaning on Jesus shoulder and she was blonde haired and blue eyed, you know, cause Hey, every little girl in ancient Palestine was blonde haired and blue eyed, I guess. I but, so. um, <laughs> I, 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 so she's like, they're leaning her head against Jesus and, as Miss Jean read the story about Jesus welcoming the children, I just thought to myself, Jesus really does love me. Jesus wants to be my friend. And that was my first mem That's really my first memory of Jesus is this embrace of God, um, of being able to lay my head on, on the shoulder of Jesus and feeling love and welcome. And I tell that partly because i mean it, that that is i think the the ethos of the book there is a lot of tenderness in the in this book and it was really a challenge to write that without being overly sentimental well and, you achieved it you achieved it thank thank you um but i was talking on a podcast with um a group of four i think it was young pastors uh all men and they were in their thirties and forties. And one of them finally just blurted out how much he loved that chapter where I was sitting in that Sunday school room. And I said, well, I'm glad and it kind of surprised me because these are not the kind of guys who would generally love a chapter about Jesus as uh, their friend. But he said, the reason I loved it is because I never experienced anything like that. It, it, he said, when I was growing up, the first memory I have of Jesus is that Jesus wanted to send me to hell unless I accepted him as my Lord and Savior. He said, I was terrified of Jesus. And then the other three pastors all chimed in and they had grown up in churches like that, too. 
And all of a sudden, I just thought to myself, oh, my gosh, I never realized what an incredible gift I had been given as a, as a toddler. The idea that a loving God wanted me to be sitting in a circle um, with, a, with Jesus, with love, and with God. And, and every time in my life I've ever struggled, it's been that vision that comes back to me. And it's been the most assuring, shaping reality that I, that I know. I mean, it, it will probably be the last memory that I have before I die. But that these young men grew up in churches where they were literally taught that God was a warlord. And what, who hated that. What kind of pastors are they now? Well, now they're, they're all pastors that have left like the Southern Baptist church, oh, they've left uh -huh. the, yeah, they've all de deconstructed their fundamentalist faith and, uh, they were a blend. I think one was a United church of Christ minister, the UCC, very progressive Protestant denomination. I think another was a Presbyterian and there might have been, uh, a Lutheran as well. I maybe two Presbyterians. Well, um, so they were really, you know, so they were very mainstream now, uh, but that their, their struggle with that, with the idea of a loving God just continues and continues and continues. And that being pastors, they all talked about how that's what they keep having to put out, you know, to their people. And in a sense, they're healing themselves as they um, do their ministry. Well, I agree with you that this is exceedingly important work because I meet people all the time who know that Jesus means something loving, but they were taught dogma and doctrine, which they reject with every ounce of their being because they know that it's not loving. And a lot of people feel they ended up throwing away the baby with the bathwater and they don't know where to go now. How do I embrace Jesus? How do I embrace the love? How do I embrace the truth of whatever that is without the wrapping that I can no longer adhere to or even agree with? And uh, your book is an example of the kinds of books that are out there that allow you to see Jesus in a different way. Um, one that I think particularly because Diana speaks from within the Christian tradition, I think uh, particularly speaks to those of you who are Christian, who were raised Christian, and who are looking for that freed Jesus. Uh, my story, um, Diana, was that I was visiting the Vatican, and I had been a student of the Course in Miracles uh, for a while. So, you know, so much of this was new to me, and I was fascinated. Not that I ever had felt that this meant conversion to the Christian religion, but still I had a whole relationship to things that I had not had before. And I went to the Vatican expecting to be overwhelmed by this experience of Jesus. And I had the same thing that yours, you had, except my voice said, let's go to the beach. You want to go to the beach? Let's go to the beach. <laughs> now, I don't even, there's not a beach in Rome, right? I mean, well, yeah, yeah. But that's what I heard. Let's go to the beach. You want to go to the beach? Let's get, let's go to the beach. It was that same, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Love the paintings, <laughs> love the art. Let's get out of here. So, and I don't mean to offend any Catholics, by the way. Uh, I have a lot of respect. I, I believe that in all the great religious systems of the world, including Catholicism, including all the great religious systems of the world, have that mystical core of truth. And all that we're talking about here is finding it. But I thought that was so funny when I read that because I'd had the same experience. But mine was, let's go to the beach. Want to go to the beach? Let's go to the beach. <laughs> Diana Butler Bass. I just love yeah, it. I know. I know, a beach. I, I think your book is wonderful. Everybody remember Freeing Jesus. And um, when we're talking about transforming the world, um, nothing could be more fundamental than that we transform our notions of God, our notions of spirituality and religion, and, of course, Jesus. So Diana Butler Bass, love the book. Um, thank you so much. Is there anything else you can think of that you uh, want to point out about the book or Jesus or anything like that that you'd like to talk about before we, before I let you go? Oh, I just, I, I hope that, that people will pick it up and give it a chance. I know that these are tough days to pick up a book that says Jesus on the front because of that Jesus Absolutely saves the perfect sign. time for it, I think. <laughs> but I do, I do think that part of the healing is going to be understanding 
the the wisdom of this you know rabbi that lived two thousand years ago, and that we can we can follow to a place of real love, and we can follow to a place of empowering um, and uh, justice, yeah. and so. That's what I, I, I dream of. I love the part in the book where you had been with some rabbis and they really taught you about the word rabbi and what it means that Jesus was an itinerant rabbi. And uh, that meant a lot to me too. So thank you, Diana. Congratulations on another wonderful book. And uh, I hope all of you who are looking for free Jesus in your own life will pick this one up. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marianne.